The following program is a presentation of the Wapaka Historical Society. All right, thank you very much and welcome. So our presentation tonight is Wapaka 101, the history of our city. And this presentation actually is also in, uh, coinciding with an upcoming exhibit over at the Public Library. So opening on October 28th, running through December 3rd, is Wapaka History 101, our Indigenous and Immigrant History. So we're collaborating with them. There'll be some photographs from our collection over there. They'll talk a lot about Wapaka's history, starting with um, American Indians that lived here before, and I'll talk more about that, all the way through the white settlers that came to the current immigrants that we have in Wapaka. And all of those stories are important to our history here. This presentation also came out of, like Jeff said, conversations I have a lot with people that are just common questions. People want to know about Wapaka history. So in preparation for this, I actually was talking with someone who was a new resident of Wapaka. And he said, I've got lots of questions. And so he sent me an email with probably 25 questions. <laughs> and you know, I've, been, I've lived here now for 13 years. And there were things when I first started at this job that I thought, I just, why is that called that? Or why, what is that? Why is the casino a casino? And it was, is it a gambling casino? So there's all those questions we get. So that's kind of how this presentation got started. All right, so we're going to start at the beginning, and that is the best and the most important place to start for our area's history. So about 100,000 years ago, much of North America was covered in glaciers. As those glaciers moved, they carved hills and bluffs and lakes and rivers into the landscape. By 10,000 BCE, which is before Common Era, the first people, which were the ancestors of the Menominee, had reached Wisconsin. So for thousands of years, the Menominee occupied about 10 million acres across Wisconsin and Michigan, including much of Wapaka County. The Menominee and the Wapaka area moved between large villages on Taylor and Otter Lakes, and then camps along the falls on the Wapaka River, which would be basically where Rasmussen Park is today. Numerous trails and pathways crossed the Wapaka and the Chain of Lakes area, leading indigenous people um, and numerous tribes through the area, not just the Menominee. The Ho-Chunk, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe, along with the Menominee, traveled frequently through the area. Many of these trails and pathways became the roads that lead through our county today. By the 1830s, the largely uncharted lands of in Wisconsin attracted the interest of white settlers. In a series of seven treaties, the Menominee ceded their lands to the United States. The final treaty in 1848, the same year Wisconsin became a state, relinquished the last of the Menominee's land, which included Wapaka. This map is from the Wisconsin First Nations and shows where Wisconsin's 12 American Indian tribes resided. And this is circa 1800. So it kind of gives you an idea and you can see the Menominee across Wapaka County there. On this map, F.M. Benedict, who was a Wapaka teacher turned developer, noted the location of more than 60 effigy mounds around the Chain of Lakes. The late woodland peoples from about 650 to 1200 built effigy mounds, or large-scale sculptures in the shapes of people and animals throughout the state. Around the Chain of Lakes, more than half of the mounds were located near the east side of Taylor Lake, previously called Clem Lake, in what is now known, or what was known as Mounds Grove, makes sense. Today, there is little left of those Chain of Lakes effigy mounds outside of a partial catfish-shaped mound near Taylor Lake. And if you've driven down QQ, you can see it. There's a rock, this rock, with a plaque on the front that identifies that effigy mound. At one time, Wisconsin was home to nearly 20,000 mounds, the most in North America. Only about 4,000 remain today. So while the effigy mounds are largely gone in the Chain of Lakes area here, there is much in our area that reminds us of our indigenous past. The Menominee had many words for places in Wisconsin, including the Wapaka area. The word Wapaka is a Menominee word, meaning place of tomorrow seen clearly. Through the years, there have been myths that Wapaka was named after a chief Wapaka. It is unclear when these stories truly began, but it appears to have been most popular in the 1950s, up until recently, actually. Up until the 1930s, historical books and surveys that we have in our collection here contributed that word Wapaka to the Menominee. 
But in the mid-1900s, stories of American Indians, such as the one presented on this marker, which is in Marion, uh, became very popular, and you would see them all across Wisconsin. Even the early Wapaka Historical Society accepted that myth as truth and erected this marker through the Wisconsin Historical Society in Marion. So for the last two years, we at the Wapaka Historical Society have been working with the Forest County Potawatomi and the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, along with the Wisconsin Historical Society and the Wapaka County Parks and Rec, to dig into the history of Chief Wapaka and find more out about the Chopadoc family, who is mentioned on this marker here. So the site where this is, if you've never been here, it's actually a really pretty spot in Marion, right next to an Amish community there. And um, this marker talks about the um, Chief Wapaka and also the Chopadoc family and notes that it is a burial site and that supposedly Chief Wapaka is buried at this location. On this marker, Chief Wapak is identified as a Potawatomi. So with Forest County Potawatomi, over a whole year, they looked into all the records that they have at their museum and um, did a ton of research on Chief Wapaka. So they discovered there was not a Chief Wapaka that lived in Wapaka County or Marion. Interestingly, though, there was a Chief Wapaka, and he's buried in Ozaki County. But as far as they can tell, there's absolutely no connection there. So there is some truth, though, in this historic marker, which is hard with some of these historic markers. There is that small bit of truth. So on this, at the end of this marker, it says his son, Chopadoc, and it goes on to talk about the family. That piece of the Chopadoc family is true. So the Chopadocs lived on this land in the late 1800s into early 1900s. Chopadoc's father was Chief Wabagay. So maybe some similars with the name Wapaka. We know that this area, because we were out there a few months ago, um, is a burial site. And the Forest County Potawatomi were out there with us, and they think there's 10 to 20 uh, people buried at that site. So going forward, the plan is this marker will be removed, a new marker put in its place, and it will tell the story of the Chopadoc family and the Potawatomi in the area, and also recognize that it's a cemetery today. So it's important to remember that the word Wapaka is a Menominee word, meaning place of tomorrow seen clearly. In the years of fur trading, fur trader William Powell believed that the word had meant daybreak or the dawning of the morning, which the French then interpreted as likely meaning tomorrow. Both of these interpretations led to the river being named the Tomorrow River, which today is that small portion of the Wapaka River in Portage County. Many places throughout our area and state have roots in the Menominee language. Many of the names of the lakes around the chain came from Menominee words or are related to definitions of the Menominee words. The word for chain of lakes means in English, sprawling water like an animal basking in the sun. And then that's the Menominee word too. Otter Lake is taken directly from the Menominee word meaning otter. The same is true of Round Lake. And then Marl Lake obviously comes from the Marl found in the lake, but the Menominee knew it as the Green Lake. So if you are interested, like I am, in all the Menominee words that have built our words here in Wapaka, this website is fantastic. So it's the Menominee Clan story. It is through the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And um, the person who put this together, his name was Mike Hoffman. And if you were able to see him speak, he actually did speak here at the Holly Center in 2018 about the Menominee history here in Wapaka. And he passed away just the next year. He was the cultural consult consultant and advisor to the Menominee clan story, which at that point was housed at Stevens Point, but now it's at the Oshkosh Public Museum. So if you have a chance, go and check that out there. Um, it's also important to note that other Wisconsin tribes and people have had names for places throughout Wapaka and throughout Wisconsin. But in this case, in our Wapaka area, the Menominee words were the ones that became part of our English words that we use today to describe our local places. Oh, and I should mention too, the neat thing about this website is on the left side there, you can actually hear Mike Hoffman say the words in Menominee. He at the time was um, teaching the Menominee language to youth. So, um, it's really neat to, to hear him say it. Today, 0.6% of Wapaka County's population is American Indian. 
After the treaties to cede Menominee lands in 1848, many native communities remained in Wapaka County. As other tribes were pushed off the lands in eastern and southern Wisconsin, communities of Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi settled in Wapaka County in the late 1800s and early 1900s. One of the largest was in Marion, like I mentioned before, where the Chopadoc family resided. This map, again, is from the Wisconsin First Nations, and this shows where the tribal lands and reservations are today. Um, the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, if you're not familiar, they are located in Kashina, and they have uh, just about 8,700 Wisconsin residents are Menominee today. That's out of 5.9 million people in Wisconsin. The reservation size in Kashina is 235,000 acres. And the forest is very important to the Menominee. The Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin is known globally for their care of the Menominee Forest and their comprehensive forestry plan. And if you look at Wisconsin from a satellite, you can identify the Menominee Reservation because they are the greenest, most forested area in the state. So um, it's pretty amazing what they're doing there to continue their traditional quality of life, but to, um, that also helps them maintain an intact and healthy forest too. All right, so the first white people, fur traders, arrived in the area now called Wisconsin, specifically in Green Bay in the 1600s. White settlement began in the Green Bay area in the late, teen, late 1700s and settlement dramatically increased in the state in the early 1800s. By the 1830s, more settlers became interested in the largely uncharted territories of Wisconsin, and that included Wapaka County. So Wisconsin became a territory in 1836, and some of these fur traders and explorers likely came through Wapaka County, but none of them ever settled and stayed very long. So Wisconsin became a state in 1848, the same year as that last Menominee land was ceded to the government. And in 1850, or 1849, the settlers began their journey to Wapaka today. So the first settlers arrived by steamboat, by river, and then went as far as they could and then took those American Indian trails to their locations that they were going to. In June 1849, five men from Vermont traveled west from Plymouth, Wisconsin in search of new lands, and they had heard about these falls. That's what they were looking for. They traveled along the trails to the Wapaka River, finding the falls and making camp what, near what today is Rasmussen Park. The settlers' plans were to harness that power and establish a community on those falls. So that fall, they began to build small cabins of brush and bark and poles to survive that winter, and then they could already see that potential of the falls. Now, what we see today on the river over on Water Street doesn't seem like much, but to them it looked different, and there was a lot of potential there in the water. So between 1849 and 1852, those settlers from Vermont staked 83 land claims in our area. So this map is a, map, is a government survey map from 1851, and you can see that it notes our area as the falls of Wapaka, spelled with an extra C. <laughs> and I think this part is interesting, and I, just, I like to include it just because um, life, our, our name of our city could, could have been different. So the post office here in Wapaka, established in 1851, filed with the federal government for our name and got Wapaka. They beat out the next community, Tomorrow River Mills, by a day. And that community had to decide not to use Wapaka and instead use Wyawega. So Wyawega could have been Wapaka had the mail been faster for them. <laughs> so water and the water power drew many early settlers. This water was harnessed by numerous mills throughout our history. At one time, there were four dams within the city limits. The first mill in the falls of Wapaka was a sawmill built on the west side of the river along what today is Water Street. The mill along with the first dam across the river was built in 1850 so that, that the next year after those first white settlers came and that was built by Silas Miller. The second dam location was further up the Wapaka River near what today, today is Elm Street. The dam is pictured here in 1910 with the electric power company building to the right and the dam eventually provided city, the city with electric power. And that is the one that is still there. That dam is still there um, over off of Elm Street. There was a third dam on the Wapaka River on Shearer Street for two mills there. 
a sawmill and a feed mill. So the Crescent Roller Mills, which sat on the corner of Oborn and Shearer Street, utilized that dam. The Crescent Roller Mills was built in 1884 by Robert Roberts and Samuel Oborn. It was later known as the Wapaka Roller Mills until it was purchased by Ward Fallgater and Fred Fisher in the early 1900s. The mill then became the Fisher Fallgater Mill, and as seen in this photograph on the left from the State Historical Society, and was known around the country for its rye flour. The mill closed in 1969, and at the time that that mill closed, it was the last remaining water-powered flour mill in Wisconsin. So today, the mill is partially intact on Oburn Street, so you can still go over there and see parts of it. The fourth dam, then, was on the Crystal River on Churchill Street. This location first had a grist mill, which was then converted to a woolen mill to make cashmere fabric, men's suiting materials, and flannel. In 1906, the mill became the Wapaka Felting Mill, which is pictured here. The mill manufactured felt, woolen, and knit goods, felt hats, and fabrics. The mill part, the bigger portion there, um, burned in 1932 after it had become the Kerry Company, and the Kerry Company manufactured oil heaters. Today, the Shannock Foundry operates and utilizes that dam. And as a quick note too, there was a fifth dam, but it was outside the city limits, and that was at the Wapaka Brickyard. So today, this is a question we often get, is how many of those dams still exist, and how many are still operating? So today there's two dams left, and they actually both operate. So the Shannock Foundry actually owns both today. On Churchill Street, which is the one on the right, kind of taken from actually the view of the foundry, um, the Crystal River feeds the pond, which then provides hydroelectric power to the Shannock machine shop. And then the Shannock Foundry does sell some of that back to the Wisconsin Public Service. This dam also regulates the pond's water on the east side of Churchill Street. And then the dam on the left, which is over on Elm Street, still generates power, but that is all sold back to Wisconsin Public Service. All right, so if we back up to those first early settlers to Wapaka, we start to see the growth of Wapaka first into a village and then into a city. In the 1850s, after much debate, which actually would be a presentation all in itself, Wapaka became the county seat for Wapaka County. There was lots of vote stealing. There was, oh, there was lots of drama. But Wapaka was able to get that, that name of the county seat for Wapaka County. A courthouse was then built between Fulton and Union Streets along South Main Street. This photograph from the Wisconsin Historical Society shows a gathering outside the Wapaka Courthouse in about 1870. So very, very different look to downtown. Today this area is still referred to as Courthouse Square or the Square, and the county courthouse sat in this location until 1990 when, it, when the county courthouse moved to the new facility on Harlem Street. The old courthouse was torn down in 1991 New City Hall Library opened in 1993, so they're celebrating their 30th anniversary this year of being on the square. So today, the square is still seen as kind of the center of the downtown. Businesses then grew up around that courthouse square in the mid-1800s. The buildings downtown were first primarily wooden frame buildings that housed general stores and stores offering handmade goods such as furniture and wagons and implements and leather goods. In the 1870s, the community began to rely on milling and other small industries like foundries, tanneries, and, a, and wagon and carriage makers. And this is one of my favorite photos. This is 1870 in Wapaka, and would be looking from East Union Street to South Main. So if you'd be kind of looking like where Little Fat Gretchen's is today, through, through the yard there. Um, and obviously all those buildings are gone now. There were a series of fires at one point downtown that took all those wooden buildings. In 1871, the city of Wapaka experienced its greatest growth yet with the addition of the railroad. The first locomotive and passenger car arrived through the Wisconsin Central Railway on September 28, 1871. Much of Wapaka's business had some connection with the depot and the railroad, whether they received or they shipped goods. The railroad linked central Wisconsin and beyond, which was particularly important in later years um, with the potato industry in Wapaka. Wapaka's depot changed several times over the years, but always was located in the same general location. 
So the first depot, a very small wooden building, was built in the early 1870s on the north side of the track on the east side of Oak Street. So today, it'd be pretty close to where Nemeth Steak and Chop Shop is over there. Then in 1881, a new depot was built on the southeast side of the tracks on Oak Street. Today, there's a freight house there, which sits next to the bowling alley. That depot was a two-story building that housed a depot and a hotel, and then it was moved up on top of the hill when the tracks were elevated. Unfortunately, this depot burned down in 1907, and so that's the picture up on top of that burning. The year they, they put wrong on the postcard for some reason. So it is 1907 trying to put out that fire. The railroad, though, spared no expense, and they immediately built a brand new depot, same year, and that one is pictured on the bottom and is the one that we currently have in Wapaka. So there it is. Today the depot is part of the Wapaka Historical Society and sits on the hill along the railroad tracks on Oak Street. From the depot you can see the back of Wapaka Foundry Plant 1. The Wapaka Historical Society purchased the depot in 2004 and has fully restored the building, including adding a lower level model train area. The depot is open for tours during the summer, and then we also rent the building. So the railroad had great economic impacts on the city of Wapaka. And in its own way, the Wapaka River also shaped the economy and the layout of the city. The water and the river were important to the Menominee and to other indigenous peoples that camped and traveled throughout this area. It also brought the early white settlers to Wapaka but it also impacted the main business district downtown. These downtown businesses were laid out along the Wapaka River. On this postcard, you can barely see Water Street Bridge way up in the left corner with the mills. And this picture is unique because the river looks very different than it does today, um, and there's an island in the middle of the river. <laughs> Here's a little bit better photograph. So you can see the island a little clearer. You can see the mills over on, off of the um, bridge there. Um, kind of gives you an idea how, how different that side of the river looked. And this picture was about 1904. So the North Main Street buildings were built close to the riverbank. This photograph was taken in 1914 after a snow and ice storm came through Apaca. You can just see through the trees how close that river runs to those buildings. So on the right, is the old fire station, and then you can see the rest of the downtown um, buildings. Very close. So in 1933, the city of Wapaka worked with the WPA, which was the Works Progress Administration, to reroute that river. The WPA was an agency established under Pres President Franklin Roosevelt to employ thousands of workers to do public works projects. One of those other projects in Wapaka actually was the post office that was built. The project was not only to reroute the river, but also to create a road behind the North, Street, the North Main Street businesses there. This photo was taken in 1933, just before the project began. And this one gives you a clearer picture as to just how close that water is and how easily the river could have flooded into those businesses down there. So work began in December 1933 to move dirt from the island to the West Bank. And then sand was brought in from a farm outside of town and from an unused hill near Shadow Lake Road and the Lakeside Cemetery. And I, I don't think it was anything with the cemetery. It was just on one of the portions that, um, on that hill there that they took some of the dirt. Workers also removed numerous trees from, east from the East Bank to push the river away from the downtown buildings. The work continued and was completed in March 1934, and in all, 75 men were employed on that project. So this photo shows the Wapaka River after the dredging and the rerouting, and that, this was taken in 1940. So very different. So in 1935, the city received a federal grant to landscape the New River Park. One of the first projects within the park was a skating rink. In its first winter, the rink was reportedly used by more than 700 Wapaka children and adults. Carnivals and events were held in that park in, for the community. And the park continued to change throughout the years. In 2001, the community expressed interest in improving the park again. And a band shell was added, which actually was just taken down recently. And they added more landscaping and they added a ramp. In the years since, the Wapaka Rotary has sponsored the park 
And then there's also been changes to the landscaping again and playground equipment. Okay, so another frequent discussion topic at the Historical Society is the pedestrian footbridge. <laughs> so that goes across the Wapaka River there, just south of Riverview Park. And phase two of Riverview Park's improvements in 2003 originally was set to include a brand new pedestrian bridge. It never happened. A footbridge over the Wapaka River, though, has been a part of Wapaka's history for more than 100 years. A very early bridge of sorts um, is noted in Wapaka's early history, which was simply branches piled together over the river. It was a little hazardous, but a lot of people used it, and so they saw the need to build an actual bridge. So in 1874, several residents petitioned the city to build a footbridge, and the city said, you have $25 to erect a bridge off of Division Street. But, you know, it was 1874, so they did it. <laughs> the first constructed bridge was popular not only with foot traffic, but also with wagons bringing produce from the east side of town to the downtown. And it's kind of hard to visualize today, but maybe only a mile out of the downtown was country. It was the farmland. So having a bridge like this to join the Main Street District with the east side of town was rather important. So the bridge was replaced in 1884 and again in 1910, and both times they focused more on the pedestrian um, bridge. So this postcard, I think, is from 1910. Um, at that third constructed bridge and it's also because at that point the city redid some of the grading on the side of the river to make it a little safer for people using that bridge and it looks like that's what's happened in this picture. WP they did do some improvements to the bridge as well. built, which still exists today. Unfortunately in 2012 the city closed the bridge citing safety concerns. So I, when I moved here, it wasn't used and I never did get to walk across that bridge. Um, but there has been lots of conversations lately about a pedestrian bridge in the future. So um, if you're excited about that and really would love to see that back, voice your, voice your interest. Um, I'm hoping someday that pedestrian bridge will be back over there. All right, much history lies along that Wapaka River, but there are also numerous other historic buildings and sites around Wapaka. These include both homes and businesses. Wapaka has two historic districts. One of them is the Main Street, the downtown area, and then the other is the Lake Street District. Both of those are on the National Register of Historic Places. At the Wapaka Historical Society, we often get asked what the <laughs> oldest building is in Wapaka. So there are two buildings that still exist in Wapaka that were built in 1854, and that would have been five years after those first white settlers came, so very early in our city's history. The one on the left is the Hutchison House Museum. So that was built in 1854, and it was previously located on the corner of Fulton and Franklin Streets, where Bill's Auto Repair is today. The Hutchinson House was built by Chester and Susanna Hutchinson in 1854, and they had just moved to Apaca from Vermont with their sons. Though it was briefly sold to another family, the Hutchinson family owned that home all the way until Julia Hutchinson died in 1944. An oil company then purchased the home and land in 1953, and they planned to tear down the house. Luckily, the Wapaka Historical Society had been formed in 1953, and was able to save that house and move it to South Park. The home opened in 1957, which is when this picture is taken, so it was just put on its foundation out there, and the kind of neat thing too is that that house was moved in three pieces, and you can kind of see how they would have cut that in half, and one of the interesting parts of that house they discovered when they moved it to South Park was that the insulation in the house is brick. So it was quite heavy to move even just those few blocks over to South Park. So the museum opened in 1957, and that was for the city of Wapaka's centennial celebration. The building on the right was also built in 1854 and is the E.L. Brown Law Office on the corner of Jefferson and Union Streets. It has been a law office since the beginning, and so it is the, longest, the oldest existing law office building in the state of Wisconsin. A number of the original desks, furniture, and fixtures are still in use in the building. 
So E.L. Brown built the law office in 1854. He served two terms in the state senate in the 1860s and then worked at the law office until the 1920s. His son, Edward E. Brown, eventually served as his partner and he owned the law office. E.E. E. Brown served as Wapakis district attorney, he served as a state senator, and he was a U.S. representative for 18 years. He also has a street named after him in Wapaka. He is the Brown named, um, that they named that street after. Today, the building is the Werner Johnson and Hendrickson Law Office. All right, so the oldest home in Wapaka was built in 1855, so just a year after the Hutchinson House and the Brown Law Office. This home is located on Granite Street and is named the Winfield Scott House. So the home was built in 1855, but it appears that they added a second story in about the 1870s or 80s. It looks a little different. The windows and the design look a little different than the bottom part of that home. The Scotts were some of the earliest pioneers in Wapaka. Captain David Scott arrived in Wapaka in 1849, so that very first year, and built a log cabin near what today is Rasmussen Park. As you can see, everything kind of was, that was the spot to be. He eventually served as the first postmaster of the village, and then his son, Winfield Scott, who had this house, lived in Appleton briefly, but then moved to Wapaka and was in the abstract and insurance business. He had several county jobs, and he was even a Wapaka County judge. At one time in the city of Wapaka, he owned 200 lots. So, um, and actually, this area of Wapaka, if you look on old plat books, was called the Scott Edition. And so he basically owned that whole area. All right, so another thing we get asked is, what is that building? And this is one that comes up quite frequently. So this building is on Division Street near Trinity Lutheran Church and Dairy Queen. And today is an apartment building, but it began as a church. So this building is at 321 South Division, and it's had several congregations throughout Wapaka history. The church was built in 1865 as a Presbyterian church, and Reverend Dr. Cutting Marsh, who was an early settler in Wapaka, organized that congregation in his home in 1852. And then this building was their first permanent home. In 1876, the congregation changed from Presbyterian to Congregational, but they stayed in that church. And then in 1890, their membership was dwindling, so they were looking to sell the church. And luckily, a newly organized St. Mary Magdalene Catholic Church bought the building for $1,000. So they owned that till 1932, when they moved down the street and built a brand new St. Mary Magdalene Church, which unfortunately was just torn down. So today that congregation is off on Highway 22. After the Catholic Church owned that building, it became a Seventh-day Adventist church, and they occupied that building till about the 1980s or 1990s. And then it was renovated for apartments, and it's still used as apartments today, and they just renovated it, and I think it looks really great. All right, so here is another building we get asked about. And this is the Junction Street Pump House. So you may have never noticed it because it's on Junction Street, which you might not know where Junction Street is. But if you head out South Main and you're heading to South Park and you make the left instead of the right to go down onto Shadow Lake Road, that street, that little short street there is Junction Street. So today this is owned by the City Parks and Rec and is used as a storage building. But it's got an interesting history. So it was built in 1905 as a pump house by Conrad Geminer, who operated the Wapaka Brickyard. In the early 20th century, Geminer was promoting the use of brick for silos. So that's why this left side of this pump house was designed in kind of a circular shape. So the pump house was built to pump water from Mirror Lake. In the late 1800s, the city was struggling with water quality. They had frost in the lines, they had broken mains, and at that time they were pumping water from the Wapaka River. So to address the issue, the city decided to build the pump house and pump the warmer, clearer water from Mirror Lake. But problems continued, the lake levels weren't always high, and sometimes the water quality and quantity wasn't what they wanted. So eventually the city did have to dig its own well, and it was located on Mirror Lake, and they did that in 1922. And then they eventually dig, dug more wells and, and built another pump house um, in later years. 
So here it is today. So today the pump house still sits there. Um, like I said, used by the city parks and rec, um, but there's actually a boat landing there and you can launch your boat and kayak right there. So another question we often get is, what is the oldest business in Wapaka? And I thought about this a lot and the Brown Law Office technically could qualify, but it hasn't been the same law business the entire time. So after some thought, it seems like the oldest existing business in Wapaka should have the same name and have been the same type of business the entire time. And with that, the oldest business in Wapaka is Stratton's Drugstore. So Stratton's Drugstore history starts down the road on South Main Street at the old First National Bank building. So this is on the corner of South Main and Union Street. And Frank Stratton, who graduated from Wapaka High School and then went to pharmacy school, began working with C.H. Truesdell at his pharmacy in 1901. When the bank expanded into that north portion of the, um, where the pharmacy is, they didn't renew the drugstore's lease. So then the Truesdell drugstore relocated in 1914 to the Masonic building at 105 North Main Street. So when Truesdale fell ill in 1915, Frank Stratton purchased the business and he renamed it Stratton's Drugstore. It has been in that location ever since. And when, um, when Truesdale and Stratton moved into this building, they would have been on the north end of that building. It was actually two stores at the time. So for many years, Stratton's also had a popular soda fountain and a lunch counter. It was discontinued in 1970. In 1974, after years of that drugstore being in the Stratton family, two pharmacists at Stratton's purchased the drugstore and two years later they purchased Rob's Bakery, which was on the southern portion of that building, and they cut a large door in between the two businesses and it's been that big a Stratton's drugstore ever since. As a note, the Masonic Lodge, and that building is called the Masonic Block, which makes sense, they built that in 1877, and they have been the only tenant up on that second floor ever since. So they also have been there a very long time. So the oldest business in Wapaka that has been continuously in the same field really is the law office. And I haven't discovered yet if the Brown family sold the law office to another business or if they closed and then another business came in. So I was being very technical about this question. So after doing some research, I figured that the oldest business in the same industry, not the same name, but the same industry would be the Wapaka Foundry. So the Wapaka Foundry traces its beginnings back to 1871, when John Roche started the Pioneer Foundry along the Wapaka River. Today, Hidden Park off of North State Street, which actually if you could take the pedestrian bridge would just lead you right to it, um, that marks the location of the first foundry. In 1887, his son, Fred, partnered with H.H. Seuss to form Seuss Roche, specializing in the manufacture of the Wapaka chilled plow, sleigh shoes, and sash weights for windows. They also made the crusher jaws for the Wapaka granite um, plant. The foundry changed hands a couple times in the early to mid-1900s, and then 1955 is when Clifford Schwen bought the foundry and changed the name to the Wapaka Foundry. So in the first years of the Wapaka Foundry, the business was casting truck, uh, truck brake drums, heavy truck axle parts, water and air-cooled industrial equipment, all sorts of different parts. The foundry was growing so much that they moved all operations to a brand new plant, and that is Plant One on Mill Street. By 1964, the Wapaka Foundry was melting 78 tons per day and had 150 employees. Plant Two was added in 1966, and then it became Plants Two and Three um, in 1969. The Wapaka Foundry has now grown outside of Wapaka and continues to be a leader in its industry. And if you weren't able to see, um, we had the Wapaka Foundry come earlier this year and do a program all about their, um, their history. And if you haven't had a chance to see that, we have that online and gives you even some more in-depth um, history of the Wapaka Foundry. So today, the Wapaka Foundry is the area's largest employer with 1,700 employees. And that doesn't include the headquarters staff that is there. They have 4,000 employees nationwide. And... Wapaka is actually a great location for a foundry of this type. 
Wisconsin is one of five states that produces nearly two-thirds of the nation's silica. Silica sands are the most used type of sand by foundries because it's very clean and has a very fine grain size. This makes it ideal for creating accurate molds. So simpler, simple granular sand by itself may not hold its shape when a casting is made, which is why they use silica. Though Wisconsin has an abundance of silica, the recent boom in silica sand mining has caused concern for state residents. Wisconsin has approximately 60 mining operations involved in extraction of frac sand and about 30 processing facilities today. So there's one more business that would have been older than Stratton's Drugstore had it not changed its name at one time. So the interesting part too is that this business now has gone back to its original name in part, um, which I think is really neat. So Am Hansen was born in Denmark and came to Wapaka in 1870. He learned to make wagons from both his father and his half-brother, Jens Hansen, at his wagon shop on East Fulton Street. And that sign is still up there on East Fulton Street for the, the Hansen shop. In 1885, A.M. Hansen went into the planing mill business and then built a sawmill in 1892. At the same time, Hansen was a dealer in steam fitting and plumbing goods. He eventually was appointed the superintendent of the city water works due to his expertise in the water system. So A.M. Hansen opened this building on 22, at 225 Jefferson Street in 1907. And the cool thing is, it opened 116 years ago yesterday. So um, they had a little, a little celebration there yesterday for that. So the basement at the shop was called Machinery Hall and had lathes, drilling machines, and more. And it had a carpenter and blacksmith shop on the basement level. Oh, and I should note, I'll just make a quick note, where Loot is today, the store, that was Hanson's garage. So he built that building as well. Ann Hanson's son, Alton, took over the family business, and he's pictured here on the right, you can kind of see him, down in Machinery Hall at the shop. He died in 1962, and in 1964, Wally Doran purchased the building from Alton Hansen's widow and changed the name to W.J. Doran Company. So today, the business has a new owner, and he has renamed it W.J. Doran Company, formerly A.M. Hansen Machine Hall, in honor of pr both previous owners. So the building today still holds machinery and tools from both A.M. Hansen and Wally Doran's time. And if you have a chance and you're able to go into that lower level machinery hall, it's like going back in time. It's pretty neat. So as I mentioned briefly before, Am Hansen was involved in a variety of local business ventures, one of them being a sawmill. He built a sawmill in 1892 on East Fulton Street along the Wapaka River. The, that sawmill is shown here in 1913, so after Hansen didn't own it anymore. Um, but it's got a, this is a neat picture because you can see the old high school, that's the very first high school on the right, and then the new high school, which today would be one, be one before the high school we currently have, or actually two before. So that was the second high school. The third high school would have been the middle school today, and then now we have the one out of town a little bit. But this is a neat picture and shows um, what was A.M. Hansen's sawmill on the Wapaka River. So another question we get a lot, and I actually just got it again recently, was how active was Wapaka in the logging and lumber industry? So for Wapaka's earliest white settlers, just like all early settlers to Wisconsin, lumbering was a very small industry. Towns had small lumber mills to provide basic building materials, but logging soon took off in Wisconsin. The first area to be commercially logged was along the Wisconsin River in central Wisconsin. Northeastern Wisconsin soon followed, and then companies moved farther north. The logging boom for Wisconsin was in the late 1800s, and as the state's forests were depleted, Wisconsin no longer led the country in wood production. The state still logged for pulp and paper production, which it does still today, but there was a greater priority put on conservation and reforestation. But in Wapaka, the lumber industry was a small-scale industry. The first sawmill was built in 1850, as I said before, by Silas Miller on the Wapaka River, and that mill was soon torn down and a flour mill was put in its place. In 1859, another sawmill was built on Shearer Street, which became Eagle Planing Mill. 
This location has had many names through history. So Central Lumber Company, Home Lumber Company, and Fullerton Lumber Company. And today, some of those buildings still exist on Shearer Street. If you go over there, they're all fenced in there. Really neat to look at. Um, they are in declining um, condition, unfortunately. So through the years, there were several, several other sawmills in the city. There was a sawmill where the Wapaka Police and Fire Station is today. There was one where the Wapaka Foundry is today. There was also a sawmill on East Fulton Street, where if you remember more recently, the Wapaka County Highway Department was located. There was a mill there. And where A.M. Hansen's mill was, there still is a building left there um, that was part of the sawmill um, that still exists that was built in 1919. So Wapaka had quite a few sawmills, quite a few lumber yards, but it was all a small scale operation. They provided lar largely local lumber. And in fact, a lot of those lumber companies actually harvested their lumber out of town. As a note, there were a number of Wapaka farmers that during that, the heyday of logging would head up north and work in those logging camps and earn money during the season when they weren't farming. Okay, so this one's my favorite because this question I wondered when I first moved here, when I found out about this hill. So this hill is above Neville Motors and Piggly Wiggly. And when I first came here, I thought of it as that hill with the water tower on it, but it actually has a name and it's called Mount Tom. And so once I found that out, I wondered why? Why is it called Mount Tom? So first a little about the hill. So the hill today is owned by the city of Wapaka and parts of it are leased to other companies. Today it houses two water towers, a radio tower and then two buildings. And one of the buildings is the city's and the other belongs to AT&T. So a standpipe was first installed on the hill for water pressure in 1897. And that was the same year that the city of Wapaka's waterworks was um, established. And then a water tank was built in 1975 and then that and then that was replaced by the current water tower so again why was it called mount tom so i, I looked through the history and noted that wapaka residents have been calling this place mount tom for more than 100 years it's marked on this plat map this is from 1878 as mount tom in May 1889, a fire was reported on the woods on Mount Tom in the Wapaka Republican. And in April 1894, Charles Brainerd wrote an article in the Post reminiscing about when he came to Wapaka in 1853. And in that, toward the end, he says, he's, the bright rays of the setting sun were changing steadily to a golden brown, and these in turn gave way to a crimson gray with darkening hues as the great luminary set behind the tree-capped top of Mount Tom on the western side of the town. As in early, and in early 1900s newspapers, Mount Tom is listed as a neighborhood, just like Parfreyville and Farmington, when noting when uh, visiting families would come and other local news. So despite all of these mentions of Mount Tom, never once do they tell me why it's called Mount Tom. <laughs> um, so in 1902, the Wapaka Post had an article, though, and about the possible American Indian origins of the name Mount Tom. So I was very excited when I found that, and they noted that the hill might have meant the rock or the rock beyond. However, in the article, it goes on to say that this article may or may not be true. <laughs> so not, not helpful at all. <laughs> so then um, a couple other articles have noted possible biblical origins. Luckily, I know someone, and he could tell me whether that's a reference in the Bible and he looked at me like I was crazy when I asked him about Mount Tom in the Bible. No, there's no Mount Tom in the Bible. So as a historian, we can make the best guess. And my best guess is that it's named after another Mount Tom. So those first early white settlers were from Vermont. And as it turns out, there's a Mount Tom in Vermont. So my thought is that when they first came to Wapaka and they were settling over by Rasmussen Park, that seemed like a giant hill over there and it probably looked like their Mount Tom. So um, there are also other Mount Toms on the East Coast and throughout the United States. So I think that's the best guess I got as to why it's called Mount Tom. But I'm always looking for more information. So, all right. So if we continue past Mount Tom on West Fulton Street, we all know we would head toward the Chain of Lakes. 
And if you lived in or visited Wapaka in the early 1900s, the best way to go from the city of Wapaka to the chain was the trolley. And if you watched carefully a couple years ago when the city started uh, redoing Main Street, you may have noticed that they unearthed old trolley tracks. And that's when we started getting lots more questions about the history of Wapaka's trolley. So these were taken on North Main Street, where they still were. So the Wapaka Electric and Light Railway's first streetcar went into service on July 4th, 1899. But there were several things that spurred that development in both Wapaka and the Chain of Lakes. So in 1881, the Greenwood Park Hotel opened as one of the first hotels on the chain. At its largest, it could accommodate 150 guests. And in 1887, this hotel was purchased for the Wisconsin Veterans Home, and the, ho the hotel became Marden Hall, which is seen here on the left. The Wisconsin Veterans Home in King officially opened in 1888, and by the end of that year, it had 79 residents. In 1889, Camp Cleghorn Horn opened on Columbia Lake, and then in 1894, the Grandview Hotel opened on Rainbow Lake, which is pictured on the right. The hotel boasted 10 four-bedroom cottages as well as a large hotel, box, and pavilion. And people from around the country would come to stay at the Grandview Hotel. So all of these locations required visitors to take the train to Apaca and then either take a horse-drawn carriage or a wagon, which they at that time called a bus, out to the chain, to these hotels. People saw the potential in linking the Wapaka Depot then to the Chain of Lakes through an electric trolley. So at the same time as these places were bu being built on the chain, the Wapaka Electric and Light Association was formed in April 1886. A dam and power plant were soon built on the Wapaka River near Elm Street, and the, the first rudimentary light service in the city of Wapaka began in July 1886. But the dam was inferior and it failed at least two times, and electricity was constantly inconsistent. Despite these issues, talk began to spread that Wapaka should add an electric streetcar. With tourism increasing and electric streetcars becoming very, very popular, there was much interest but not much capital. Then in 1898, Irving Lord, a Wapaka native and a member of the first graduating class at Wapaka High School, and some investors purchased the stock of the Wapaka Electric Light Association, and they incorporated as the Wapaka Electric Light and Railway Company. This new company would run the utility and then also build an electric railway. The company immediately improved the dam and power plant, and before long it was providing some consistent electrical power. So work was held off on the trolley until 1899 due to the Spanish-American War. Materials then began to arrive in May 1899, and in June, five used streetcars from the Milwaukee Electric Line arrived on the train. They were repainted for use on the Wapaka Trolley Line. Finally, on July 4th, 1899, the first two trolleys made the journey down the 4.77 mile track from Wapaka to the Chain of Lakes. And there they are working on the curb on North Main to West Fulton. So this is, oh, I flipped ahead. I'm just going to get back to my map. So this is the map that shows the trolley's um, direction. So way up on the right is the depot today. You can see it way up there. So they would follow the depot. It's, they would actually pick up just on the lower part near the depot, go past the, um, the car barn, which is where they stored the trolleys, and they'd come down Mill Street over the Water Street Bridge, go down North Main Street, and then head out West Fulton Street. And West Fulton Street had quite a big hill, so that was quite, quite the trip for the trolley up the hill on West Fulton Street. Then it would head out on Fulton all the way to where, um, to Chatty's Corners, which is where the quick trip is on QQ and um, Highway 54 today. So at that location, there was a ballpark, and then there was also a trolley platform to pick, pick people up. So then from there, the trolley followed County Road QQ to the Wisconsin Veterans Home in King. The trolley then continued on to the electric dock, which was owned by the Wapaka Electric Light and Railway Company. And the lighted stairs at that dock would take visitors down to the boats waiting to take them to various locations on the chain. For two years, the electric dock, or later it was called Downey's Dock, was the last stop on the trolley line. Then in 1901, Irving Lord, 
that we saw before, bought the Grand View Hotel and extended the trolley line all the way to the hotel. Lord hoped to extend the line even further to Camp Cleghorn and then ultimately to Wild Rose, but he never carried out those plans. So the fares for travel in the city of Wapaka range from five cents, just traveling in the city, to 10 cents if you were going from the depot to Chatty's Corners, and then 15 cents if you were going all the way out to the Grandview Hotel. And the trolley ran from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. and even till 1 a.m. on Saturdays. So it ran a lot, a lot of the day. And it took 25 minutes to go from the depot all the way out to the chain. As a note, the trolley carried more than passengers. It, always, it also carried mail and freight out to the Wisconsin Veterans Home from the depot. So after World War I, material shortages and a lack of money began hurting the Wapaka Electric and Railway, Light and Railway Company. The power plant and the dam on the Wapaka River needed work. And in 1917, the city told the company it had 10 years to pay for the recent paving of the road between the trolley tracks. Again in 1920, the city asked them to pay up. But it was clear there was no way they could pay for that. So in a compromise, the city exempted the electric line from paying that cost of paving. In return, the company's owners could use that capital to improve the electric plant and build a new dam in the brick powerhouse, which is the one pictured on left that's still there. This building, like I said, sits off of Elm Street, but no money was put into the streetcars. That, combined with the lack of profit and the increasing popularity of automobiles, caused the elect Wapaka Electric Light and Railway Company shut the trolley down in January 1926. Soon after, the trolley rails were removed from West Fulton Street. Over the years, some of the rails had been removed from underneath the pavement, and then the last of those trolley rails were pulled out um, on the Main Street project. So by the time the trolley was discontinued in 1926, many visitors were able to get out to the chain via other modes of transportation, like the car. As a result, tourism continued to grow on the chain of lakes. Tourism promotion on the chain first began after 1871 when the railroad came to Apaca. Advertisements in newspapers and periodicals in the 1880s and 1890s, particularly in the Chicago area, noted the beauty of the 22 interconnected spring-fed lakes and the crystal clear water. At some point, advertisers began to embrace two different slogans for the chain of lakes, the Killarneys of America and in all the world, no lakes like these. It is unclear when advertisers started to use the Killarneys of America slogan, but we see it heavily used in the Wapaka Historical Society collections beginning around the 1930s. So the Killarneys are pictured on the left. <laughs> and um, this is an area in southwestern Ireland that is also a popular destination for tourists. And this area was also helped by the railroad, um, and their tourism really increased in Ireland there in the 1850s. The Chena Lakes are on the right. And while we don't have the large hills and the rocky shores, the clear waters and the beauty are certainly a common feature between the two. And I think that was what reminded people of the Killarneys. So here are just a few examples of brochures and maps, in a map from the Chena Lakes with that slogan, the Killarneys of America. It was also a common caption that you see on a lot of postcards from that time period. So the other slogan, in all the world, no lakes like these, appeared just as frequently, if not more. It was included in advertising and on newspaper headers like this one for the Chain of Lakes Guide, which is the precursor to the picture post. Sometimes it also featured the Killarneys of America along with it, like on the map here. You'll see this slogan still used the, in all the world, no lakes like these on some chain of lakes advertising. So the railroad was a key factor in bringing those tourists to the chain. The same year the railroad came, 1871, was also approximately the first time a tour boat traveled the lakes. At that time, the area known as Indian Crossing was a very shallow and narrow channel where boaters had to get out and you had to drag your boat across. This crossing here, called Indian Crossing, was a converge convergence of American Indian trails across what's now Columbia and Lime Kiln Lakes. One traveled through the chain of lakes toward Lake Poygan in, near Winnicani, and the other came from Portage and went through the chain of lakes and then came to the city of Wapaka. 
Travelers on the crossing would ford the river or use an early log bridge that was there. Then in 1893, there was a lot of excitement about the Columbian Exposition or the World's Fair in Chicago. And with that growing interest in drawing tourists up here to the Wapaka area, they started to think about making improvements. So to make the lakes in the area more accessible, the Indian Crossing Channel was dredged and a raised bridge was added, as shown in this photograph. So you can see those women do not need to get out and pull their boat through there. <laughs> so this work at Indian Crossing opened Columbian Lake to a new development, Camp Cleghorn. And yes, I referred to it as Columbian Lake because today it is called Columbia Lake, but the lake was actually called Round Lake until the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. And because of the excitement surrounding the Columbian Exposition, they renamed it Columbian Lake. So in 1897, the International Order of Good Templars began looking for land in central Wisconsin to set up a temperance camp. The Good Templars, a fraternal organization, campaigned for prohibition and promoted abstinence from alcohol and drugs. Captain John G. Cleghorn, a leader of the Good Templars in Wisconsin, found a, track, a tract of 10 acres on Columbian Lake and Camp Cleghorn opened for its first assembly in 1898. Temperance was a popular movement and became even more popular in the years leading up to Prohibition, where, which was a time when it was illegal to produce, import, transport, or sell alcohol. The Good Templars, who ran Camp Cleghorn as a Good Templar training camp, believed alcohol was a serious cause of poverty, violence, crime, and led to the destruction of family. In Wapaka, the growth of the Good Templars also led to the rise of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was very popular in, in the city. So visitors would come from around Wisconsin and the Midwest for these temperance assemblies and Chautauquas, which promoted education and entertainment for the whole family. Visitors to Camp Cleghorn rented tents and they dined in the dining hall, which was the first building built at the camp in 1901. Eventually, the camp had gas lights, a tabernacle instead of a large assembly tent, and then dorms for boys and girls. After Prohibition was repealed in 1933, as the radio took off, and then as tourism increased on the chain, the original campsites were all replaced with permanent cottages. Instead of the temperance meetings or Chautauquas, the buildings at Camp Cleghorn hosted training schools, boy and girl scout camps, and gatherings like this one shown in the postcard here in 1935. Even today, Camp Cleghorn provides weekly church services in the summer, along with encouraging Christian family living and avoiding abuse of alcohol and drugs. Cottage owners at Camp Cleghorn pay an annual assessment to cover taxes and road maintenance and recreation, and members can rent out their fellowship hall, though gone are the large events at Camp Cleghorn. Today there are more full-time residents, but some still go back generations and continue to return to Camp Cleghorn. So moving east, through the chain of lakes, we end up at Camp Onaway. And camps on the lake are a frequent question we receive, and people don't often realize how many camps there actually are on the chain and throughout the Wapaka area. Camp Onaway on Onaway Island between Sunset and Rainbow Lake has served as a summer camp for the Boys and Girls Brigade since 1908, providing a picturesque setting for children grades 6 through 12. This island itself was purchased in about 1910 for the brigade, which is now headquartered in Nina. In the early years, children were taught how to get to the island, pitch tents, find wa water and firewood, and, um, and cook their own food. So today, the camp activities and the layout are a bit different, but the brigade continues to operate that island as a summer camp. They offer boys and girls camps, as well as leadership and international camps. And the camp itself is also used for church groups, and they even offer winter camps out there, too. All right, nearby Camp Onaway is Crescent Island, or Club Island, or as many also call it, Esther Williams Island. And I had to laugh because when I Googled the island, on Google it is Esther Williams Island. So that is the name that, <laughs> that Google understands it to be. Um, over the years, this island in Rainbow Lake has gone by several different names, but Esther Williams Island seems to stick the most, likely because of the good story it, it holds. So Esther Williams' connection to the Chain of Lakes is small, but it's really stuck to that island. Esther Williams was a competitive swimmer and a Hollywood actress. 
and she appeared in numerous movies, and she specialized in aqua musicals, which featured elaborate syn synchronized swimming and diving. She received the nickname Million Dollar Mermaid after she starred in a movie of the same name. She retired from acting in the early 1960s. So the question still is, what is her connection to the Chain of Lakes? So Williams was married to singer and actor Ben Gage from 1945 to 1959. And at that time of their marriage, Gage's family owned Crescent Island. So however, shortly after their marriage, the cottage that the Gages owned on that island burned down. The rumor had always been that Crescent Island was a sanctuary for Esther Williams and that she would swim between that island and Loyola Point and supposedly she preferred the clear waters of the Chain of Lakes to anything else. Um, but <laughs> there's never been any proof of those claims. Um, though, as someone brought up to me, you know, if she didn't want anybody to know about that, she wouldn't have told anyone. So, I, you know, I, there's that. <laughs> But um, she did have an autobiography in 1999, and she did not mention the Chain of Lakes or Wisconsin or Wapaka. I know, it's kind of, it's kind of a letdown. <laughs> um, despite the facts or the absence of facts, though the island still is called Esther Williams Island, and the stories of her swimming in the clear waters of the Chain of Lakes, I still hear. So, you know, there's that slim, slim piece of hope that we have that maybe that was true. So on maps, as early as 1898, this island, though, is called Club Island. This possibly was named after a local informal club of businessmen who liked to fish and have a good time near and on that island. They were often referred to as the Bluegill Club. Thus, it was called Club Island. However, that name did not last long. In fact, in our collection, the, a postcard from 1907 refers to it as Club Island, and then in 1908, the same island is referred to as Crescent Island. So Crescent Island obviously is named for its shape. In terms of who owns that island today, the Gage family didn't keep it long after the house burned down. A few years later, the owner of Edmonds Dock, which today is Clearwater Harbor, purchased the island and placed a mobile home on that island. Edmonds later sold the island to Camp Onaway. So today the campers sometimes refer to the island as Cub Island, which I think is maybe a takeoff of one of the original names. So Sunset Lake itself has a lot of history. And another question we often get is about the artesian springs on Sunset Lake. This stereo view card kind of gives you an idea of how clear the lake is on Sunset Lake, where you can see the sail on that boat reflected in the water. Sunset Lake was first known as Hicks Lake, named after one of the early white settlers in the town of Farmington, Roswell Hicks. Sunset Lake was, la was likely the first lake to have a structure built on it as well. Myron Reed built a red boathouse sometime in the 1870s, and then Major Robert Roberts, who was a local bank president, he built the first cottage out there in the early 1880s. This was about the time then that the Pure Springs were discovered by Dr. George Calkins. Calkins was a well-established established medical practitioner, having served as an assistant surgeon in the Civil War. In the early 1880s, Calkins became interested in the springs in Sunset Lake. He was sure that those clear waters were uncontaminated and that he could be, those could be used for medicinal purposes. He sent the water in for analysis at a chemistry lab, and in 1884, he received the results. The water was free of organic matter and sulfates and would qualify as medicinal. So Dr. Calkins then established Shealtiel Mineral Springs and Bottling Works. Shealtiel is a biblical name and word meaning asked of God or gift from God. Calkins sold the water, touting its ability to cure a variety of ailments, including kidney diseases, indigestion, and diabetes. Though Calkins bottled and sold the water throughout the Midwest, local residents could have it for free. He also sold the um, water at local resorts on the Chain of Lakes, too. And he offered tours from his docks, and then eventually he added a restaurant on his property. Dr. Culkin's dream was to open a sanitarium to treat the ill with the spring water, but it never happened. Dr. Culkin's died unexpectedly in 1896 of sunstroke. The pavilion built over the springs, though, still sits near the shoreline, and today Dr. Culkin's great-granddaughter and her family own that property. All right, so before we leave Sunset Lake, we are going to head to the eastern side of the lake and to this beautiful retreat on the hill. 
Loyola Villa sits on the peninsula on the southeast corner of Sunset Lake, adjoining Rainbow, Taylor, and Otter Lakes. Many visitors and residents alike see Loyola Villa on their boats or on a cruise, but are unaware of the long history of that property. In 1895, Father Thomas Sherman came to preach at the Wisconsin Veterans Home for the whole summer. Impressed with the area, he sent word to the Jesuit order that there was land available on the Chain of Lakes. In spring 1896, Father Leopold Bouchart came and purchased 10 acres on the peninsula for a Jesuit retreat. The Jesuits are the largest Catholic male order in the world and are most identified with a secondary and higher education. Marquette University is a Jesuit college in Milwaukee. At this location on the peninsula, the Jesuit order decided to build a place for professors in their Wisconsin and Missouri high schools and colleges to rest and enjoy outdoor recreation. The first building erected on the land was a two-story frame house with wide veranda porches. It housed 65, or 64 people every year. The retreat was called Loyola Villa, named after Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. By 1898, the retreat included a boathouse, a stable, and a windmill. Today, that boathouse is one of the most recognizable pieces of their land on Sunset Lake. An addition was built on Loyola Villa in 1909 to allow room for about 50 more students and teachers. During World War I, the villa closed, and when it reopened, it served as a training or normal school for teachers. For many summers, the men from Loyola Villa were known to rent a large passenger boat and sing songs as they cruised the lakes. Today, Loyola Villa is open to all members of the Jesuit order and then still serves as a rustic summer retreat. So these are the stairs that lead up to Loyola Villa, and there's the house too. So sometimes a little hard to see from, from the water. So Loyola Villa, Camp Onaway, there are all these places on the Chain of Lakes that have such history and that we all hear about. But the Chief Opaca, where you hear a lot of these stories, also has a really interesting history. So the captains often tell all these stories about the Chain of Lakes, but I thought it'd be fun to talk about the history of the Chief Opaca. So in the early and mid-1900s, tourism was booming in the Chain of Lakes. Visitors came all summer long, boats and canoes toured the lake, and more cottages were being built along the shores. But while visitors still came, tourism in the 1970s had slowed slightly. Two local residents, Joe and Pat Megan became interested in an old sternwheeler in Oshkosh. Leon had had interest in bringing boat tours back to the Chain of Lakes that had been so popular in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And this seemed like the way that that dream was going to happen. So the boat had been built for the Chief Oshkosh Brewing Company by Schwartz Marine of Two Rivers to commemorate the brewery's, brewery centennial in 1963. It was designed to be a replica of an authentic sternwheeler built in 1907. In 1963, the chief sternwheeler measured 65 feet and was powered by a 50 horsepower diesel engine. But that brewery fell on hard times. So the company sold the boat just two years later to the Lakeshore Oshkosh Kiwanis Club, who tried to restore it and care for the boat. But after a few years of trying, they were looking for a buyer. Luckily, two Wapaka residents were interested and they purchased the chief in 1973. Their plan had been to remove the boat from the ice on Lake Butamore, but they couldn't and had to wait until the ice thinned that winter. The 18-foot wide sternwheeler was then lifted on a flatbed truck and transported to Wapaka. So that spring, the men restored the boat, including the lower cabin, repainted the hull, and installed a new 165 horsepower engine. That, they christened it the Chief Wapaka, which, as we talked about earlier, is kind of ironic, but, you know. <laughs> um, and picked up their first passengers at Ding's Dock in the summer of 1973. The boat ride was an hour and a half long, along the chain, and eventually Megan became the sole owner of that sternwheeler. He later purchased the former Edmonds Dock property and in an effort to diversify, renovated and transformed Clearwater Harbor. This photo shows a new engine being installed in the sternwheeler in 1986. So Clearwater Harbor, or Harbor Bar, became a draw for food, music, and boat cruises. And with that success, Pat and his wife, Mimi, bought another cruise boat. And they named it the Lady of the Lakes. It was meant to look like the old boats that traveled the Chain of Lakes in the early 1900s. And obviously, it looks very much like those early cruise boats. 
With its smaller size, the Lady of the Lakes was also specifically designed to fit under the Indian Crossing Bridge. Today, the boat's available for private parties and cruises. So now, we finally return to the Indian Crossing Casino. Of all places on the chain, we get asked this question most often. Was this actually a gambling casino? So the Indian Crossing Casino opened to the public on July 4th, 1925, with thousands of people in attendance. And this photograph was taken just days before it opened. The casino was built and opened by William R. Arnold of Chicago and managed by Francis Steele. Arnold operated the casino along with some rental cottages, a boat landing, and a swimming dock on Columbia Lake. Historically, the word casino describes a building used for entertainment or dancing, comparable to a social club. It did not refer to gambling, and it has never been a gambling casino. And the term Indian Crossing was named for that crossing right next to the casino between Lime Kiln and Columbia Lakes. So Arnold and Steele created the casino with a vision of establishing a dance hall that would attract both local and national bands. Dances were held every weekend throughout the summer for many years. Arnold sold the casino in the 1930s to John Martin and the casino continued in popularity through the 1970s. Given its central location in Wisconsin, the casino was able to schedule big <coughs> name bands when they were on the road traveling between Minneapolis and then Milwaukee and Chicago. Bands that played at the casino in the 1930s and 40s included Glenn Miller, Louis Armstrong, Gypsy Rose Lee, Les Brown, and Duke Ellington. In the 1950s, the casino hosted such bands as Woody Herman, Tommy Dorsey, and the Dukes of Dixieland. And in the 1960s, the Everly Brothers, Ricky Nelson, Bobby Vinton, Herman's Hermits, and the Beach Boys. The casino, though, had mixed success after the 1970s. Today, it's open seasonally for food and drink and still hosts summer concerts and events in that dance hall. So tourists loved the recreation available on the Chain of Lakes, but there was still a need for family entertainment for tourists and residents alike. On the outer part of the Chain of Lakes, a family amusement area became popular in the 1960s and 1970s. The amusement park was first known as Ponderosa and had a stagecoach and mechanical rides. It also had the old slanty shanty, a building which was an optical illusion, an animal farm, live robberies, and jailbreaks. The park was open during the summer and admission was $1 for adults and 35 cents for children. So these are a couple postcards of Ponderosa in our collection. In the early 1970s, Joe Leon bought the Ponderosa and renamed it Fort Wapaka. Children could ride miniature cars or pet visit the petting zoo. There was also an old-fashioned saloon, the Silver Dollar Saloon, with employees in costumes and with decor like the Old West. Each week, a new queen of the Silver Dollar Saloon was chosen. The stage robberies and the goat that walked across the bridge were also among the popular attractions at Fort Wapaka. In 1975, Jolien sold Fort Wapaka, and the new owners had plans to keep it open 10 months out of the year, put up new buildings, and have hourly plays for visitors. But as business slowed, Fort Wapaka closed. The buildings became Primrose Lane, a row of gift shops. Many of those buildings were moved out over the years, and the area has sat quiet. Last year, plans were made to develop that area. And if you're not familiar where that is, it's right off of QQ after you go past um, the hardware, the Quick Trip and the hardware store on the right. It's kind of an open area with a couple old buildings. That's where that was. So lastly, I wanted to throw in just a couple tidbits that I get asked a lot about the Chain of Lakes. First one is, are there sturgeon in the lakes? And the answer is yes. There are sturgeon in the Chain, uh, chain of Lakes. Um, they've been seen in Minor Lake, and they've also been reported in Lawn Lake. And I'm not sure of the size because we get asked that too. Um, yeah, exactly. Seen You've seen it. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but I think it's just interesting that there's sturgeon in the lakes. So. You see it? Eight, eight awesome. Feet long, eight feet long, eight feet. 125 pounds. Yeah. Oh, wow. It got hit by a, a boat, a prop, and killed it. So when they found it, it was dead. Oh, my goodness. Like that, that's where they found it. Really? So, as I'm one of the captains of the chief. Hmm? And I spoke to one of the uh, grandchildren of the person that found it, and she verified the story. Oh, how cool. Uh, no, it was on Rainbow. Okay, we on saw Rainbow. it on Miter just last, uh, last year. Yeah, this, this was years yeah. ago that this yeah. happened. And wow. three years ago, as we were always going around uh, past uh, 
on Oahu Island, in the shallows there, we would see sturgeon there. Oh, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. The other question I get asked an awful lot is, is there a police car in the lakes? And um, namely, a Chicago police car is the question I get. So, oh yeah. So, you know, I've been director eight years here, and I think I hear that at least once or twice a year. And, um, you know, the, there is, there's some truth there. Um, the Chicago gangsters hid out and stopped here, it's very likely because they were heading up to the North Woods. We, are, we know that they went up to that way. Um, the Chicago gangsters were very active during Prohibition and trying to flee the law. So it's possible that they came through the chain of lakes. Now, it doesn't make too much sense that there'd be a Chicago police car here when they could just call Wapaka and have them take care of that. But, you know, I, I guess it could happen. But um, the reality is that no one's ever seen a Chicago police car or a police car in general in the lakes. However, the story continues that there might be a mafia-owned car in the chain. And that one at least maybe has some truth. We're not sure. I mean, so if anybody scuba dives in here, we'd love to know. But the story is, so the Chicago Mafia, Al Capone, they were all prolific in the 1920s. And we know they went up to the North Woods. It's very likely that they hit out here because at that time, that would have been a very long drive from Chicago up north. So the story is that there is a mafia-owned car in the bottom of Rainbow Lake. So it's supposed to be off Government Island on the side facing Nestling Lake where it's really deep. And the story is that there's a shelf near the bottom of the lake and that is where that car sits. Now, supposedly the car was left out on the ice during the winter, never retrieved, and then it sank to the, to the bottom. There was a period, I can't remember how long ago it was, but they put a bunch of fake stories and was either in the buyer's guide. Oh, did they? And those stories were all part of that. Yeah, yeah. So, so we want to know, you know, so, so if you want to scuba dive down into there and tell us. But um, with asking this, I was asking the Chain of Lakes Association about this, and they said there is a home on Minor Lake, though, that used to be owned by a member of the Mafia, and he had a home and then an extra home for his security. So the story continues. So we, we will see. And I think the prohibition history of the Chain of Lakes, because we've heard a lot of those stories about even like bootlegging and hiding alcohol and things like that. I think once we have a digitized newspaper collection, which is coming soon, those will be really fun stories to dig into and see what we can find. All right, so the last question isn't historical, but because the Chain of Lakes Association, they were so helpful with my presentation. I, one of the questions I get asked a lot too is, is there, if you live here or if you're visiting but you're not staying on the chain, where can I go to enjoy the chain? And the Chain of Lakes Association has some great resources and this is a map that's on their website. And um, you know, when I moved here too, I wondered, well, there's no public beach. And I mentioned before that the Grandview had their own beach, but that would have been only for people visiting the hotel. There's still no public beach. Um, when I moved here, people suggested that little park over by the casino that's kind of across the street. You can kind of wade in the water there, but it's just a, it's just a park, and it's really not that, what that's supposed to be. So this map, though, gives you some great ideas, and is a great, um, great website to visit, too, um, just to give you ideas. And I love that they use, in all the world, no lakes like these, mm -hmm. still on their slogan. Mm -hmm. so, so that is my presentation tonight. I covered a lot of ground, and there's more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And when I finish this, when I finish this, as I'm reading it today, I'm like, oh, I should have added this and this. So there may be a Wapaka 201 coming. <laughs> and um, like things like we, I just realized I didn't answer like why the Wapaka High School or the schools have the comets as their as their um, mascot. So there are lots of questions. Um, in the back, I did put some of our resources that we have upstairs here at the Holly Center. So if there's more questions you have and you want to come in and dig into them, we have a great resource center upstairs. And um, one of those books over there is another question I often get asked, which I think will be a future program, which is why, how did the streets get their names? And there's so many different streets here. I know when we moved here, my husband said, well, why is Churchill Street named this? Winston Churchill? It's not Winston Churchill. So there's lots of stories there to talk about, and hopefully we'll do another program, but you can check out those books in the back too. So does anyone have any questions tonight? If not, thank you so much for coming, and please visit us again if you think of those questions later. So thank you. Thank you.